Hey everybody, talking a little bit more about taming the toes tonight. We're gonna to go into a little bit more detail, but first of all, um, you might already know me, you should already know me. Um, I'm Dr. Kent Hungerford. I'm a specialist podiatric surgeon here at Relieve Health Group, South Coast Foot Surgery, um, and My Health Education. Um, my focus is really on chronic pain management, um, minimally invasive reconstructive foot surgery, uh, and also those high risk sort of foot patients, um, also management. We run a bit of a clinic around that as well. Um, so this evening, we're gonna be going through a few different things. Um, ingrown toenails, um, corns, callus, and those bumpy bits that are annoying for our patients. Um, hammer toes, and a little bit on plantar plate pathology, but I don't wanna to go too much into that because we'll be covering that next week uh, or next month. Um, the subungal exostosis, our myxoid cysts, a little bit on our tumors, and then a little bit of uh, what's next and some sneak peek on some of the events coming up as well. <clears throat> but let's jump straight into it um, and I'm going to go through in a very similar way, show through a few videos on each of these conditions um, and really just sort of go into a bit more depth on these more common conditions that we might be seeing um, as well as some of those less common. But our ingrown toenail, um, we're all very comfortable and familiar with that. Typically it's going to be just a, you know, a medial lateral sulky uh, you know, spicule that comes through, can cause a little bit of pain for our patients, can be, uh, cause infection, hypergranulation tissue. Really that diagnosis is clinical. This is obviously one of the worst ones that you can get. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it'll just be pain, sometimes red. We all, we all know sort of what they look like. Um, when that hypergranulation tissue comes up, obviously can become more painful. Um, looking at this one, obviously with a little bit more colour around it, it's starting to show a bit of infection, um, bacterial infection. Typically I wouldn't be necessarily looking at antibiotics myself until it's getting past that IPJ. Commonly these ones will resolve by themselves. And we've all seen the GPs that, uh, you know, will put patients on antibiotics at the smallest amount of pain and that's not necessarily good antibiotic stewardship. So we just need to be aware of that. But when we start talking about sort of what else causes it, um, we need to start thinking about our fungal infections and our nail dystrophy that can really start to make the nail more fragile and potentially cause um, you know, fractures in that nail, um, which can then become ingrown. So conservative management to start with. So prevention is key. We all know cutting straight across, not necessarily putting the Vs that are, you know, is the old nursing sort of um, tail as well. Um, a lot of us would be doing a nail side sort of excision, um, I'd hope, and this is something when I was teaching the University of Western Australia students that was a really big thing that they weren't too aware of. Um, some people will use a beaver blade, I like a 15 blade myself, um, and you know, just really coming down the side and uh, sort of flicking it up. I was going to put a little bit of a video um, here for those that are not as familiar, but I think most of us uh, would be pretty comfortable with that um, and doing that too. What, you know, with, without moving it, removing that side, you're not necessarily going to clear or resolve the pain. Um, and again, as we all are aware, not going too proximal because the likelihood of recurrence can be a concern. Um, and if it already is very proximal, then you're possibly looking straight to a procedure as it is, um, particularly if this is a recurrent concern. Um, antibiotics, if there's a bacterial infection that's quite large, some, patients, some um, practitioners will really like hydrogen peroxide down the side to clear it out. I'm not too big on that one myself, but I know it's quite commonly undertaken. Um, silver nitrate's great when there's a lot of hypergranulation tissue. I do recommend sort of just being um, careful around that with regards to how deep that's getting and steering away from bone, being aware of infection. Um, but definitely um, I've had some pretty good results in that sort of overgrown hypergranulated tissue. That's sort of worth mentioning as well there. When we start talking about surgical management, um, all of us would be quite comfortable with our, our partial nail avulsions, our total nail avulsions, um, with or without matrix phenylizations as well. Um, and you know, really getting um, comfortable with those and making sure patients are comfortable in that being undertaken. One of my sort of hot tips on this, um, and particularly in New South Wales where we are, is um, all podiatrists can use Repivacaine up to 0.75%. It's got about a 15 minute um, you know, time until action. Um, 
or onset I should say, and then the, um, you know, the time of action is about six to eight hours. So it really gets past that initial inflammatory phase where um, people should be more comfortable and that's something that um, you know, practitioners and um, you know, practices can purchase to make these patients a little bit more comfortable. And I, I typically mix in 50-50, um, the lidocaine with the ropivacaine. I'm not going to go into that as far as max safe doses today, um, but feel free to reach out on that one as well. When we then start looking to, okay, um, you know, a partial nail avulsion, a total nail avulsion can be appropriate in certain, um, you know, uh, approaches or different toenails there. But sometimes when there's a lot of hypergranulation tissue, we need something a little bit more invasive, um, something that's going to clear away all of that tissue and maybe even just narrow that nail as well as the skin and therefore the hallux that little bit more. And that's when we look at the Winograd nail wedge resection um, or Sharps nail wedge resection, which I've got a bit of a video that we're going to go through um, and I'll talk you through that one as well. Um, and that's, uh, you know, is something that's used when, you know, either there's previous partial nail avulsions or total nail avulsions um, that have been unsuccessful uh, and we're really looking for that more finite sort of uh, outcome there. Another sort of surgical management in the failure of some of these concerns can be a total sharps matrixectomy where we cut away that matrix uh, and stitch the toe back up um, without any of that matrix. Now, not commonly undertaken, but can be a really good option now uh, when we do need it. But let's have a bit of a look at the video um, that we've got here. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more depth and explain that as we're going through it today. Um, hopefully all my videos work tonight. Um, basically, like we all know, um, you know, prep sterile. Um, I've got a bit of a tourniquet on here. I'm using something similar to the Thwaites clippers. This is actually an older video um, with previous instruments. This is actually one of the PA nail sets, just so that you've got a bit of an idea. Um, what we're doing is, um, well, I'm trying to get that whole nail side and the skin around it. So I'm actually cutting straight through that nail at the proximal base. Uh, and what I'm going to do is then do an ellipse sort of around that nail uh, to make sure that I can get all of that matrix clear. Um, once that's clear, then I'm going to take out that skin area, which is going to come out with the tissue pretty much right down to sort of the periosteum, um, which is, you know, very aggressive and I tend to be a bit more aggressive than some of my colleagues, but my recurrence rate's pretty much nothing with these. Um, and what we're wanting to do is really just get this tissue out and then make sure that that, uh, you know, sulk is clear of any matrix that may be rem remaining. And I think in a moment we're going to see sort of some of that sort of whiter tissue that can be down there, um, which can be sort of reminiscent of some of the matrix that remains in that area. And you can see I'm just trying to remove all of that to make sure that it's nice and clear. Um, once that I'm comfortable that that's out, then I'm basically going to be thinking about my closure. I'm going to approximate those sides, make sure they come together, because sometimes it can be a lot larger than in this case. Uh, and then we're gonna throw a few stitches, hold it together, and the stitches are in for about two weeks before they come out. Um, and, you know, it's like any stitches, a little bit of pain just as that's pulled through, but otherwise pretty comfortable there. Now you can see that this patient's already looking much more comfortable. Um, there's not going to be any concerns with sort of any regrowth um, because that whole matrix area has been removed. Uh, and this is sort of my go-to procedure when I talk about ingrown toenails that have already had a podiatrist um, or you know a GP already have a procedure because it means that I'm definitely going to get rid of that matrix. It means that we're, our recurrence rate is going to be pretty much non-existent. Um, you know, definitely less than 3%. And the one thing um, that I would recommend to you guys that maybe see other patients um, or patients from other practitioners, is just to be really um, clinically aware of osteomyelitis, which could be actually why they're having recurrence. I will always do an X-ray um, pre-procedure when I'm seeing someone else's patient that may have already had a surgical intervention, just to rule that out. I know one of my colleagues, um, you know, found out after doing a procedure that they'd had a, um, a longer term osteomyelitis where basically the distal hallux or the distal half of the hallux had completely eroded. Uh, and so when that sort of happens, you start thinking, okay, well, we need to have that clinical suspicion um, in the, even in the um, presence of no signs of infection. So just being really aware there. 
Um, something I'm seeing a lot of in the last two weeks, um, you know, this one here is actually a patient I saw last week. Um, this is a patient from the week before, I think it was. Um, I saw one very similar to this again yesterday. And these are the patients that you would be seeing as podiatrists quite commonly, um, that are just have those really thick corns, whether they're neurovascular, um, post-trauma and scar tissue. Um, these are the patients that we're seeing, you know. Uh, the, the diagnosis is definitely clinical. We're wanting to sort of push on it. As we all know, if we push on it, it's more painful, then it's more likely a corn. If we're squeezing, more likely a wart. <clears throat> but, you know, irrespective of whether it's on the toes, sort of like this, and I would imagine you can't really see it too well with all the light. Um, but, you know, on that fourth toe, there's a little bit of a hammer toe and a little bit of corn on the end of there. And that's sort of something that we see more commonly. Um, you know, you would be seeing um, in between the toes and we'll have a bit of a look at a video of that in a moment. Um, but really, it, it's quite a clear diagnosis um, when we know what we're looking for, uh, like us. What I would challenge you to think though, is what's the biomechanical um, you know, underlying contributors there with regards to, is there any osteophyte arthritis? Is there a plantar flex metatarsal or the hamatose that are actually causing this? And what are some of the things that we can put into place? But really it is due to that underlying pressure, the rubbing, poor biomechanics. And we know that some of our other health contributors, um, whether they are arthropathies, inflammatory skin conditions, inflammatory arthropathies, um, and just the general process of aging where we do have you know, thinner skin, more fragile skin, less fat underneath our foot. These can all be big contributors that we're looking at. Now, when we come to conservative management, uh, podiatrists, we're, we're king at this um, and queens at this because that's, uh, that's our bread and butter. Uh, definitely the debridement, the enucleating, but when we start talking about in between those tricky toes, uh, you know, it's a bit harder to debride in there and that's where I find silver nitrate's always a good option. Um, again, I'm a big believer in the silver nitrate, particularly into digital, we can really get a good outcome um, where it basically dries it out, grabs it and takes it away. Um, particularly if you've got some of those holo holoma malaise that are a little bit softer, a little bit more moisture, we're really going to get a really good outcome. Um, the high urea content moisturizer, it's fantastic sort of underneath that sort of forefoot over the top of digits. Do be careful in between. I find most patients or a lot of patients will have a little bit of a reaction if they're more consistent with it, which is what we do want. Um, so just being aware, sometimes that can cause like a, a mild burn, um, you know, tingling and just that hot feeling uh, if they're using it consecutive days. Um, as we know, some really good deflection padding, um, felt cutouts, donuts, silicon devices, um, you know, our, our toe socks, all those sort of things are really good in conjunction with our wide and deep footwear. And depending on where this concern is, you know, some orthoses, uh, but definitely that biomechanical assessment and management is incredibly important. For myself, I, well, I'm typically seeing these patients on referral or uh, you know, they, they've sort of come across me and said, you know, I really want a longer term solution. And that's when we start talking about some of our surgical management. Um, I was just having a bit of a chat earlier with regards to, you know, there's some really simple surgical options that we're looking at here where patients are back on their feet, you know, within sort of five to seven days in their normal shoes. They're not needing anything more than a Panadol and maybe an Ibuprofen. Um, and they've got no downtime really. Um, and that's sort of what we're here for, where we can get away with some of our simpler procedures like our percutaneous flexor tenotomy. So, you know, where we're just doing a tiny incision underneath the foot, which we'll see in a moment, um, to help bring that toe back into our straightened position, or whether we're doing a, you know, minimal incision ostectomy of whether that's the phalanx, let's say there's an interdigital fifth um, which we'll see in a moment, um, you know, for those abductor varus toes, really, yeah, we want to put that into a straighter position, but we also want to remove some of that bony prominence from that area. Similar with that image that we saw earlier, which I'm going to go back to, this patient's planned for a little bit of a metatarsal head resection, a plantar um, metatarsal head resection, um, as well as then an elliptical sort of excision of that lesion, which means that we're going to be uh, really putting people into a much better position longer term. When they do have larger sort of areas, uh, you know, it's about offloading and removing that pressure. And often we can do that quite effectively through some of our minimal incision procedures. Most of the time, um, all of my, well, pretty much all of my hammer toes are minimal incision. 
I do get pretty good outcomes um, which are consistent with our open procedures but with a, a much quicker recovery um, by doing this and less risk with regards to no implants or wires at the end of the toes. Um, when we do need a little bit more correction, let's say the toe's completely rigid, we've got a lot of arthropathy there. Um, you know, think your rheumatoid patients, um, in particular a lot of contracture, real clawed toes. That's where I am going to need to do a few more osteotomies or bone cuts, um, you know, through the phalanx, which might be a multiple, um, you know, osteotomy procedure, um, as well as a metatarsal osteotomy, which is sort of um, what we call a, a distal minimally invasive metatarsal osteotomy, um, a DMMO. Uh, and what we do there is basically allow that metatarsal head to dorsiflex and then shorten. And by um, dorsiflexing and shortening, it's going to reduce that plantar pressure underneath and remove that uh, pressure, hopefully, enough to resolve the lesion that we're looking at. A lot of the time, these are um, just floating osteotomies, so there's no fixation again. Um, patients don't find significant discomfort after these procedures as well, because they're very atraumatic uh, in uh, the approach. We're not doing too much uh, harm to all of our structures around there and uh, because we're not opening up. That's all through a two or three millimeter incision. Now, I think we're going to be having a bit of a look at um, one of these now. Um, this is pretty much the videos that you're seeing and will continue to see. So um, bear with me. This is one that I uh, do have up on YouTube. Uh, and I think it just really explains it in a quite quick way uh, without me having to lose my voice as I explained it all uh, all night as well. So let's have a bit of a listen. Hi everybody, we're just looking at a uh, gentleman that's come through here at South Coast Foot Surgery. Um, we're just about to do, undertake a procedure, but I thought I just might explain quickly. Some people do have really bad corns between their toes. Um, so we're going to have a bit of a look at that one now. And this gentleman um, has come through, yeah, and you can just see in there that it is, you know, not quite nice and there's a little bit of a spur underneath there. We're just looking at a little bit of an x-ray and you can sort of see just here that we've got a bit of a horn. We're going to take that off today and let's have a bit of a look. Here we are just putting a bit of injection in. So this is Pivocaine Lidocaine. It's going to last anywhere between six to eight hours. Uh, we're doing a bit of a scrub. You know, we do these procedures completely sterile to reduce that risk of infection. Sterile gloves on, everything's set up. We're ready to start. Just making sure that that toe is completely draped, everything's good. We're going to do an incision here, and this incision is about two to three millimeters, and that means it's going to heal really quickly. We go straight down to bone, make sure that bone is very clear from that x ray so that we can then remove it. Here you can see my rasp, and this just has a few serrations just so that I can really feel and uh, grind down that little area of bone to make sure that uh, it is completely removed from that area. I'm now just checking it and we can really feel this because it's been causing a lot of pain for this patient and so once we double check that I'm happy we can then flush that area to make sure that there's nothing there. We take a bit of a fluoroscope here and that's going to be our x-ray. Once I'm 100% sure on the x-ray and we'll see that later, I'm then using some stereo strips. We use stereo strips because it's so small we don't need stitches. Once we've got that in place, we then put a dressing on and this dressing is going to stay on for about three to five days, depending on the patient. And you can see that it's quite simple. A little bit of tape to make sure that it all stays in position. And here we are with our x-rays post-op. You can see that we have that spur there that we looked at previously. A little bit closer, we can see that horn. Uh, and there it is, nice and clear so that we can all see. And what we're then looking at uh, is, you know, where we're then going post-op. A little bit more out, and then we're going to zoom in. And then you can see here that with that red line that it is completely removed. Here's our five days post-op, very small incision that is now healed and this patient's going to have a really good outcome. They're pretty happy to then go back to all activities, showering as normal. They've got this little band-aid on just for a couple more days and otherwise they're going forward without a corn in between their toes. So I really love these procedures because you can just see, you know, this is about two minutes 30, really quick, okay, this is what we can do. If more, <clears throat> if more of us podiatrists knew that it was this quick and that patient's five days um, as a higher risk patient on blood thinners that didn't need to be seized, you could see there was no bleeding, two millimeter incision healed after five days, had no pain, no need to take any um, you know, pain relief after the procedure, although some people do need Panadol, um, not many need anything more than that. 
um, you know, no stitches. There's just no reason that we need to be worrying about this sort of, you know, every three to six weeks on our patients coming back where we get really frustrated because they're in pain, we can't manage it, the skin's fragile, they've got these other risk factors where we can just do a once and done and not have to worry about it. Um, and so that's where I really like these sort of ones because it's like, okay, well, let's not worry about the general anesthetic and the risks with that. Let's just fix what we need to do in a really safe way. Again, you know, you, you saw there, I'm using like a, a three millimeter, a three milliliter syringe to put the injection in because it's such a small volume. This is not going to impact uh, for most of our patients there. When we start talking more about sort of hamatos and a bit into the plantar plate pathologies, um, it starts to get a little bit trickier. Now we, we all know sort of what a mallet or hamato or clorto looks like. Um, we see these coming in quite commonly. Um, we may have associated corns and um, pain uh, with that. There may be um, gout associated. There may be some psoriatic nodules, um, you know, and that's where we need to start thinking, okay, well, what are we looking at? What's causing pain? Um, how are we going to manage this more so than just, um, you know, debriding some of these areas? Um, but really, let's get a clear understanding of our diagnosis and what may be leading to this so we can really start looking at that underlying. Um, I challenge you to really understand what's happening, trial some things, but if nothing's sort of working, you do need a bit of a further understanding to put the, the conservative care into place. That's where I'd say, you know, get that x-ray, get that ultrasound, you know, have a bit of a look at the plantar plate. We all know sort of those dorsal drawers of the plantar, of the toe to check that plantar plate, the direct pressure. Differentiating between, say, a Morton's neuroma, which we're going to cover off next month, compared to a plantar plate tear. You know, is there di um, diversion of, um, di uh, of the, the toes that, you know, could be indicating that there might be only a lateral rather than medial plantar plate tear? All these sort of things we need to be thinking about, you know, and how acute is this? If it is acute, then yeah, let's tape it down if it's a plantar plate concern. Um, but being aware, you know, if some of these conditions, um, you know, like I've mentioned, rheumatoid can have these concerns um, quite commonly. Um, but a lot of it is going to be genetic. Um, anyone that says otherwise, you know, men still get bunions and hamatos, even though we don't wear pointed shoes as much, as I say in my pointed dress shoes. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, we need to be really aware that, that there is going to be other factors that really lead to this. And a big one of those is genetics. Other things are, you know, the bunion deformity. We start to get those, you know, impacts on that plantar plate. Um, those crossover toes just do the direct pressure. You know, I mentioned the Morton's neuroma when we've got that swelling mass, the uh, neuroma bursal complex uh, intermetatarsal, that's going to put a lot of stress on the plantar plate. But, you know, the same thing's going to happen with our marathon runners and our, our football players that are going to be potentially directly traumatizing and potentially having a dorsiflexion ex, um, uh, injury that does cause a lot of discomfort, pain and concerns. Now, some of these patients will have associated pressure in corns um, and that could end up as ulcerations as well. And so uh, definitely looking at a preventative approach where appropriate, um, but educating our patients about, okay, well, what's this going to look like, um, you know, in the next year, the next five years, the next 20 years, so that the patients do get an educated understanding of what to expect. Now, we're really good at this stuff, okay? The deflection padding, um, maybe some metatarsal domes will help to sort of dorsiflex those metatarsals, bring those toes into a, a straighter position. Um, the felt donuts, um, you know, to offload some of these areas of concern. Uh, you know, the silicon devices again, our silicon socks, our, our toe strengtheners, um, you know, seeing what patients tolerate, what they don't tolerate, our autoform devices. Um, again, working these into something a little bit more, um, you know, longer term is with our orthoses, um, you know, and after a very comprehensive biomechanical assessment and that biomechanical management. Uh, but the crux is really wide and deep footwear and having our patients being compliant with that, um, as tricky as it is, uh, is something that we need to do. And so I'm a big one for saying, okay, well, these are the footwear groups around locally that have got more of these sort of wider and deeper footwear and a few things that orthotics can fit into as well. But don't forget your taping and strapping and 
you know, definitely, you know, thinking about that Cancer Council ribbon as it's going around the toe just to help pull it down. And you'll see in a moment uh, on this next video of sort of how I tape the toes after a procedure. And I typically like this done for about four weeks post procedure uh, because, you know, in the same way as an acute injury, we want these toes to heal into the corrected position, um, you know, after the bandages come off at that five to seven days. But there's nothing wrong with doing that for ongoing management in our patients, particularly if they're getting activity, uh, you know, initiated pain where you go, okay, well, if you're only doing dancing for two or three hours a week, why don't we just tape it during that, ex uh, during that activity and make sure that we're comfortable to do so. When this doesn't work, you know, we've got a few other options. You know, we've already talked about that percutaneous flexitonomy where we release that tendon underneath the toes um, and we're going to see that in a moment. Um, but then we also talk about sort of, again, the, the toe bone and the metatarsal bone osteotomies where we're bringing them back into a straightened position and potentially shortening them um, to make sure that we're right. Now, other things that need to be addressed, and a lot of people come through, and I had one lady recently um, in the last few weeks who had a very large bunion to the point where it had completely ruptured her um, second plantar plate um, on her right and almost completely on her left. And so her toe was a, a proper cock up toe, which just wasn't going to be doing anything there. And in these sort of situations, I'm like, okay, well, we, we, we need to fix the bunion because the, the hammer toes started because the bunion's taken all the room that it would sit down into otherwise. And I can't fix that second toe until the bunion's out of the way. Now, you know, in our younger patients, definitely fixing the bunion uh, and then the second toe is a really um, appropriate way to go. And, you know, any other toes that may need fixing, of course, by that stage, typically there are other deformities uh, of the other lesser toes. Um, in, you know, uh, a healthy patient, that's a really good option. In the case of this uh, lady that I'm thinking of at the moment, she was quite elderly, um, has a few other health issues, uh, definitely has some concerns with her bone density. Uh, and so I'm like, well, the bunion's actually not painful for her. And that really starts to change up the conversation. She doesn't want to have a procedure that's going to take her at least, you know, two to three months to recover from. Uh, you know, when initially she's sort of thinking, well, this toe's the only problem and my bunion's pain free. And in that case, in a patient that is potentially um, health compromised, that's where an amputation can be a, an appropriate option, uh, which is what we're going to go uh, and proceed with uh, in this case. But you know, there's very select times that I would do that. Uh, I'm not uh, typically for amputation, but with the right patient, it, it can be a really good thing. Um, a lot of patients come through to me and say, just cut it off, cut it off. And I say, well, here's the other options. Uh, this is the type of patient that actually came to me and I said amputation goes, oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> Let's do it, that sounds great. Um, and so, you know, having that conversation with the patients saying, okay, well, a more appropriate procedure may be to do the bunion correction and the hammer toes. In this case, isolated pain, isolated concern, that's where an amputation may be an option. Now, I'm not gonna go that far in this next video. We're gonna have a little bit more of a look at a simpler procedure just to show you how simple some of these tenotomies can be. Um, and in this case, we're doing a flexor tenotomy of the second, third, and fourth toe, uh, and an extensor tenotomy of the second toe, just to bring it down into a, um, a nice position here. You can lose a little bit of strength, but don't let that scare you yourselves or your patients or the physios that really just uh, are nervous about that. Um, you know, these patients are appropriately selected to make sure that we're going to get the right outcome for them longer term, uh, but it's definitely something that we do have a bit of a look at as well. Um, with any procedure, a nice prep is always important. Um, double checking now that we're draped, that everything's numb. Um, and I've just done some digital and intermetatarsal blocks for this patient. Um, you can see that uh, through that, there was a little bit of that clawing that we're looking at there. Um, what you're seeing here is actually a 61 beaver blade, what we'd use for a partial nail avulsion. So tiny, tiny, it's one of the mini blades. And all I'm doing here is releasing that uh, flexor tendons. I'm releasing that PIPJ capsule. And you can see that I'm moving it around a little bit just to make sure that it's completely free. And it's really, you can feel this um, when it does release. And once we're there, I'm pretty happy to move on to the next toe. Um, you can see that there's reasonably minimal bleeding maybe a little bit and you'll see in a moment that I sort of wrap the toes sometimes just to reduce that. 
um, it's really nothing in um, the whole scheme of things. Um, what you will see is that those toes are going to basically correct as I'm going through and that's what I'm wanting to see. This is a nice procedure because I basically say to my patients at the end, are you happy with your toe position? Because worst case scenario, this is what we're looking at. Now you can see here what we're doing is um, that extensor tenotomy, just releasing that capsular area uh, as well as the extensor tendon uh, in this area. Um, again, this is where some of the instability can come from, but I think the ability to correct that toe into a better position is really ideal here. Um, we then want to look, and in this case, there was actually a medial second DIPJ, uh, you know, corn that was of concern. Um, I'm just using my um, blacks file to actually go in there and release some of the capsule before we actually do the ostectomy in this area. And you'll see in a moment sort of the minimally invasive drill, which I, this is it here, sort of explain as the dental drill. Um, and basically what we're doing is we're just sort of, uh, you know, removing a little bit of that bone in that area in the joint and then checking that under the x-ray, which I've got positioned off to the left of camera just to make sure that we're completely clearing that area. And so the patient's toe is in a corrected position, a nice straight position, and we're not going to get this corn in this area now because we, we, it's in an air, uh, area that's quite, you know, basically conga concave rather con than convex. Now you can see that I've um, sort of flushed the area, I've taped it, I've got all the dressings on, um, and those toes are into a much better position. The patient was really, really happy with sort of what they were looking at here. Um, this is a patient I actually saw yesterday. We called her uh, this morning just to check in and see how she's going. She's had no pain, no pain at all. Uh, and that's sort of what I'm wanting to see more often. Uh, these patients do respond well. Um, I'm actually seeing her next Tuesday in all those dressings, the post-op shoe will come off. Uh, and we'll probably just have some of what we call Luco Silk, which is a really nice sort of tape that I uh, use just to hold those toes into that position uh, for the next couple of weeks until we have full healing, typically that two to four weeks. Let's have another look at one of the other conditions that I love and I'm seeing quite a lot of, um, our subungal exostosis. This was, uh, and you know, we'd like to see them like this. And um, we had this very nice large one of about sort of six, seven mils over the top of that distal phalanx. Um, but there's a lot of things that can happen to that subungal uh, area. And you know, they can be like osteochondromas. And really the, the clinical diagnosis and clinical suspicion here is definitely recurrent ingrown toenails, particularly if there's some helix, helix elevatus where the, the basically from the IPJ, the distal phalanx is really just dorsiflexed. Um, but my clinical test for this is rather than ingrown toenails where you're pressing on the sides of the nail, um, they're getting pain. If you're just pressing right on the apex of the, um, the, the toe, then that's where it's going to be painful more commonly when you're looking at a subungal exostosis or you know, potentially uh, an osteochondroma in that area if you can't physically see it. For those that are getting lifting nails that are coming up, it's quite common that this is the concern. When we want to start assessing that and getting that, um, you know, more than a clinical diagnosis, an x-ray can be really uh, effective in providing that, but sometimes it can just be sort of like a fibrocartilaginous sort of, um, you know, what I call a ski jump. Uh, and so, you know, to assess that ski jump more appropriately, sometimes we do need ultrasound. If you're starting to think, okay, well, there might be some vascularity or some concerns there, then definitely getting the MRI or even a, a spec CT can be an option there. Um, other things that can be, uh, like I mentioned, the osteochondromas, the osteoid osteoma, um, do start thinking, okay, well, what, what's the actual ideology of this? Could it be just that it's the hallux elevatus? You know, maybe just genetics, maybe there's trauma. I saw a lady earlier this year who just had uh, fractured the tip of her distal phalanx. Uh, and that sort of meant that it was sort of into that uh, sort of ski jump position, causing a lot of discomfort as well. So start thinking about this, start pressing on the tip of the toes. So you can actually, you, and you can actually feel that it's quite solid there. Uh, it's bony, it's definitely not soft tissue. And this could be the reason that your patient's actually getting a lot of uh, ingrown toenails potentially. 
Um, conservative management is, is and I, I say meticulous now, okay, because I really mean it. These patients typically will come back with significant ongoing pain uh, and a lot of ingrown toenails. When you're sort of seeing this and you've already done procedures, you need to start thinking, okay, we've got to x-ray this. One, to rule out osteomyelitis, but two, to diagnose that something could be under that uh, subungal area. Uh, again, that, that deep footwear, you know, maybe some padding to plantar flex the hallux can be a good option, particularly in those with hallux elevatus. Um, but from my perspective, if these patients are not getting a you know, reduction in pain, definitely that surgical management is a really good one. Um, the next video you'll see is a minimal incision ostectomy, really nice procedure, um, which is just a you know a two three millimeter incision at the distal or um, or the apex of the hallux uh, can be quite good. When we're not sure of the etiology, definitely an open ostectomy um, for our osteochondromas and sort of our lesions that we need to make sure definitely that we've curated any of those bone cells away so that we don't have recurrence uh, is is a must in that uh, aspect. But also think about with our patients that have got that um, hallux elevatus, that just an IPJ capsulotomy can be a really good option. Undertaken just with a 61 blade or a 64 blade um, beaver blade, and these are very tiny, uh, small uh, blades, that you know, a single stab incision releasing that dorsal capsule can mean that that toe comes down and prevents a lot of these concerns. These are the patients that you're going to see that are you know, more likely your marathon runners or your athletics um, kids, your soccer players that are in sort of tighter shoes, boots, doing a lot of miles. Uh, these are the ones that we're talking about here. But in the meantime, um, let's have a bit of a look at a, a quick video here. Uh, and I'll talk you through. This was actually a, a younger lady um, who was very excited to see this uh, video afterwards as well as the family, um, but with permission showing you guys, of course. Um, you can see I've, I've, I'm doing my stab incision. This is actually the 64 blade that I've got there. A Little bit of bleeding, even though we've got that cuff on just initially. And you can see I've gone straight through to our um, minimally invasive drill just to start to reduce some of that uh, uh, you know, bony bulk in that area. The x-ray that you saw earlier was actually uh, this young lady's, uh, you know, quite a large lesion in that area. And you could see maybe a little bit of that bone paste on the end of that minimally invasive drill as well. Um, pulling in the uh, x-ray, uh, the fluoroscope, so I can see exactly what's happening. Um, and then, you know, again, double checking that we've got everything in the right spot. We're doing everything here. Um, Sometimes these patients can lose the nail after the procedure. Sometimes they can end up with a bit of a, a subungual hematoma. In this case, it was pretty atraumatic as far as to the nail bed, uh, and that hasn't happened. Um, and this case was sort of one that was uh, about two years ago now. Um, and then you'll see here that I actually am able to remove a fragment of that uh, um, you know, subungual exostosis, and it's quite a large one there. Um, so, you know, these are the sort of things where you're like, okay, well, yeah, that is quite large. Definitely a good flush uh, for these type of things. Um, and in this case, I typically just throw a single stitch. More commonly, these patients will have a little bit of nerve irritation to that distal hallux, um, but uh, it really does work quite well uh, to make sure that this isn't a concern longer term. Commonly, I will also do an IPJ capsulotomy in those with a bit of elevatus through the hallux. Uh, in this case, I, I haven't proceeded to that um, because the toe was actually quite in a, a good position as it was. It was just that it had that really large exostosis that we saw on the x-ray earlier, which we had. Mixoid cysts. Um, I love mixoid cysts. Uh, they're, they're much nicer than ganglions, although they're pretty much the same thing. Mixoid cysts have to do with the phalanges. Um, they're basically a ganglion or fluid-filled sac on the fingers and toes. Um, and you know they, they can come up quite quickly and they're very persistent. Uh, a lot of people will say, oh, just, just um, put a needle in it and it'll go away. That's less likely to be the case because it's due to a little bit of underlying pressure um, and some you know, biomechanical concern, um, whether it's due to the arthritis, rubbing or uh, some previous trauma that may have occurred in that area. 
definitely uh, a lot of the time it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, I, I know that you can't really see it too well, but we've got a little bit of a bubble down there, which is um, probably about sort of six um, mil diameter um, and coming off of the toe by about five, four or five millimeter as well. And so, you know, these are the sort of things that we do see quite frequently. Um, I quite like these and, you know, treating them can be quite effective. Um, but really, uh, you know, when we're going to treat these, we need to treat them appropriately. Uh, definitely some deflection padding or felt cutouts, donut silicon devices can help to reduce that pressure. Again, remember that we've got a bit of arthritis underneath there. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we're not aggravating that either it is more likely going to be progressive. So our wide and deep footwear, um, looking at our orthoses, our biomechanical management of these deformity, um, and, and that could mean that there's a bit of hammer toe concern there that we need to look. Gold standard for these is an aspiration and a corticosteroid injection, not just an aspiration and squeeze the, uh, the ganglionic fluid out. We need to put a bit of steroid in there to give them the best chance. And even then you're probably only looking at a 50 to 60% chance of resolution. Um, some patients are pretty happy, it doesn't come back too bad, uh, you know, most people can sort of manage them without having to do any uh, procedures, sometimes they can self-resolve. But for those that are finding quite a lot of pain or it's rubbing in a way that means that it's more commonly bursting, causing infection um, and potential ulceration, that's where we then start to talk about our surgical management. In these cases, we can do either, a, you know, say a minimal incision um, arthrodesis, ostectomy, arthroplasty. Um, so we're getting rid of that, uh, you know, fusing that joint, um, removing some of the arthritis uh, or removing part of the joint to, you know, bring it back together a little bit more and, uh, you know, solidify where some of that weakness of the capsule may be. Um, but otherwise, we're doing a, a, an open primary excision of the cyst. Um, and a base cauterization, where basically we make sure that you know any fluid's not going to come back up through that area. Um, <clears throat> that could be with or without stitching um, of that deeper capsule as well. I don't have a video for that one, but this one I've got some great photos to finish up on. Um, you know, really we start talking about tumors and there's so many tumors and I just want this to be sort of something that you think of. Um, definitely the red flags are lesions that are, uh, you know, coming up that you haven't previously recognized. Um, but there's quite a lot of sort of uh, benign tumors that we're looking at as well. Uh, in this case, this is a, you know, a very slow growing uh, tumor that we've got here. Um, and if you're suspicious, yeah, get an x-ray, get an ultrasound, get an MRI. You really want to know, okay, is, is there something vascular that's happening there with infiltration? Because that may mean that it's a little bit more uh, concerning and that we need to jump on it a little bit sooner. Now, tumors are not, uh, malignant tumors are not something that I deal with myself, but when we look at these slower growing tumors and things that come through our rooms, um, I'm quite comfortable in that space, definitely. Um, of course, all these type of uh, lesions are sent away for histopathology, because really we wanna know sort of whether we've got that fully encapsulated uh, or whether there are any concerns that we're you know, potentially needing to look at the rest of the body as well um, in partnership with our colleagues um, GPs and otherwise. But you know, start thinking about the genetic, the trauma, exposure to chemicals, radiation, including sun cancers we're looking at there, um, and any other cause that could be coming from the tumors. Now, without going into the precise ones, and I'm working on a speaker on that one as well, um, you know, I'll leave it at that much at the moment. But you know, conservative management can be okay once you know the diagnosis. If you're unsure, you need to cut it out. Um, and that's sort of what we're looking at. Um, in this case, this patient had actually been wearing um, thongs in North Queensland uh, for a prolonged period of um, time, when I'm talking about 15 years, as this lesion slowly grew, uh, and they basically couldn't get back into enclosed footwear. Um, it was a colder year and they were wanting to start looking at enclosed footwear and so presented for um, an opinion and management when it came to sort of their lesion underneath their toenail here. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see that on the screen there, but we're seeing that there is definitely some type of a lesion underneath there. When we talk about uh, surgical management, um, an open excision uh, is you know, an appropriate one, potentially with uh, uh, larger borders. In this case, it was quite a well-defined lesion. 
Uh, and so, you know, look away now if you're not wanting to uh, see some of the more gruesome uh, images. Um, but this is sort of what we're looking at here. Um, basically, as that nail with a total nail avulsion um, was removed, we could see that lesion quite well uh, and it actually came up quite nicely as well. Um, what we're actually looking at here is a, a plexiform epithelioid schwannoma. So it's a, it's a nerve tumour. Um, it can be associated with other lesions. Um, and so this patient did have a full check um, by their GP following just to make sure that there were no other lesions. Of um, importance here to sort of understand is because of the pressure of the nail down on this lesion, it's actually caused a huge groove in that distal phalanx. It's deformed that distal phalanx and that's unlikely to be resolved. Now to close this um, from a surgical technique point of view can be tricky uh, and that's why we ended up having to shorten that distal phalanx uh, and then basically fold some of that plantar skin um, you know, coming back and over the top there just so that we had a dorsal closure. This patient had no concerns, lesion taken out in full um, and no recurrence to date. Um, you know, these things can come up, um, they can reoccur as well. Uh, and so being really careful with these type of lesions is, is quite important, particularly if they're off, say, in this case, nerve cells, which of course uh, in the hallux is going to be less common. Uh, but, you know, just being clinically aware of all of these type of concerns moving forward.